right, welcome to Exodus chapters 15 and 16. Glad you're with us. We've got everybody else here in person live tonight. Um, before we get started, and probably you're here because you're watching from bradflack.com slash exodus, but if for some reason you're watching this on YouTube and you didn't go to the website first, then go find the website, bradflack.com slash exodus, and you'll see all the pictures, maps, diagrams, uh, I got videos that are more explanatory, um, all that kind of stuff. And so you can just go there and you can find all that information. This video is just me talking. So if that's boring to you, then go there and find all the cool, fun stuff. <laughs> uh, Mike does, Mike does, uh, at least I, I know that one person, uh, who does pay attention and goes and watches the stuff and looks at it. So, <laughs> so it's, it's awesome. Um, and, and another thing is a quick reminder because it, it, it plays now going forward through our conversation, the four promises of the Exodus. And that comes out of Exodus chapter 6, which we did a few weeks ago. Um, and the first one is, I'm going to set you free from your slavery. So they're now where we are in chapter 15, they're on the other side of the water from Egypt. Like they're gone. They're out of the land. The, the, the Egyptian army has been washed in, in, in the tumble cycle and in the washing machine there. And they all drowned in the, in the Red Sea. So they're set free from slavery. So what I keep doing is I keep kind of giving us a, an up to date. So, boom, we're free from slavery. Okay. Now, the problem is we're not free from the slave mindset yet. And we're going to see some of that today, that institutionalizing We'll look at that. So I'm going to say we're not there. God did mighty acts with a strong right arm. To uh, He did the plagues. He did the parting of the Red Sea. Like he is on point here. Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm not saying that's done, but I'm saying he has definitely shown us that part already. And then the fourth promise of the of the Exodus was, I'm going to take you to be my people. Like that basically is wedding talk. Will you marry me? Right. But he's not saying, will you marry me? He's like, you're going to marry me. I'm going to take you right. to be my people, and I'm going to protect you, and I'm going to provide for you, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll, we'll see beginnings of some of that tonight, okay? okay. So let's go into um, chapter 14 as a quick review. Chapter 14 of Exodus, they literally went through the water. Uh, Moses was holding his staff up. And it was like walls of water on either side. They walked across on dry land. And if you actually go to bradflack.com slash Exodus, you can go to chapter 14. And there's actually, uh, it says that the, the pillar of smoke or, or cloud went before them during the daytime. And at nighttime, the pillar of fire was there. And there's a, there a place on the beach where as the water is parted and that pillar of fire slash smoke is leading them across where the sand is actually melted there on the beach. And I've got a picture of that for you on bradflight.com slash Exodus. Cool stuff. Okay. So that's where we are. We're now on the other side and we're on, we're in Midian. Now we're in Northwest Saudi Arabia, um, opposite of the Sinai Peninsula on the eastern shore of the Sea of Aqaba, A-Q-A-B-A -A or A-Q-B-A, -A, whatever. I'm not Saudi Arabian or Egyptian, so my pronunciation is not very good. <laughs> All right, so let's go into chapter 15. We're going to read through this, and we'll stop along the way and have some conversations. All right, and again, I'm, I'm in the modern English version. You're in whatever version you want to be in, uh, but I'm, I'm in the modern English version as usual. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke. Now, hold on. That is the first time that we see kind of here is a song. And this is what they sang. Here's the words. Here's the lyrics to the song. That's kind of the first time in the Bible that we see that happening. Now, we know there's an entire book of songs and psalms that comes later. But this is the earliest uh, point here. Okay. Uh, and do you remember who the author of Exodus was? Moses. So Moses is writing in third person here. You catch that? Then Moses and the children of Israel, like he didn't say, then me. Yeah. And if you'll remember, I've, I've said this before, John 
the Apostle John, he, when he wrote in his gospel, instead of saying, then John, like writing third person, he felt like that was kind of weird. But he was also a little bit weird because he kind of went the opposite direction. And he said, the disciple that Jesus loved. <laughs> so he, he still talked about himself in third person, but he didn't say, oh, old John, I'm talking about myself. He's like, oh, you know, the disciple that Jesus loved. So here we see Moses talking in third person. Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Right? right. Number one and number three, he has triumphed gloriously. Okay? He has thrown the horse and his rider into the sea. The horse and the riders and the chariots of Egypt. Right? I mean, he's literally looking at what's happening, and he's like, i got to write this down. <laughs> he's, he's writing himself a postcard. Don't forget what Jesus, you just witnessed this. Don't, don't forget it. It's right here. Okay. Um, the Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He saved me. Right? So we're still ticking, on, ticking along here. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. My Father's God, he's talking about the forefathers, which is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that came down through the, the, the lineage. There was not very many of them that were still following God, Yahweh, Jehovah God, in Egypt at that point. But he is saying, my Father's God, that's who it is. Not any of those... Egyptian gods, Jehovah Yahweh God. Okay, and I'm using Jehovah Yahweh because some people pronounce it one way or the other, whatever. I think it's actually Yahweh, but that's just me. Um, then he says this. He goes, he is my God, and I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord, that, that all caps there, the Lord there is Yahweh. The, the, the Yahweh, the God Yahweh, is a man of war. What's he saying? He's like, "Woo! Yeah. He knows how to he knows how to tear it up. He beat a whole army by himself. What did we do to cross over and, and, and beat the Egyptians? We didn't do anything. We all we did was hike. We just went on a ten mile. It's ten miles from one shore to the other. We went on a ten mile hike. That's all we did. We didn't have swords. We didn't have guns." We didn't have Navy, Air Force. We had nothing. We just, it wasn't anything that we did. God is that man of war. Okay? And Yahweh is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army, he's thrown into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. By the way, in one of the videos that I have uh, to today for you i put um started uh you, if you're on the website you can go look at it but on the cotton the caption i said go to i think the 23 minute mark or something like that i'll tell you where to start for chapter 15 and 16 there but that same video if you watch it earlier there's actually artifacts in the red sea that appear to be upended chariot axles with wheels that coral has grabbed onto oh, wow. coral doesn't grab onto sand did you know that? Coral doesn't grab onto sand. Coral grabs onto rock or hard surfaces. So when you have sand across here in the bottom, but you have coral attached to it, it's attached to something. And so anyway, you, when you go to there, look, look at that video. It's really cool. Okay. The depths have covered them, and they sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, right, number three here, your right hand, O oh Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O oh Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your excellence, you overthrow those who rise up against you. And you send out your wrath. It consumes them like stubble. Do you remember the last time we heard the word stubble? They were making bricks. And he said, well, we're not even going to provide the straw, the hay for you anymore. So you're going to have to go out into the fields and pull that stubble off. That's right. That's what's left over at the bottom after you go. And that is very dry and it burns very quickly. So he says, you send out your wrath and it consumes them like stubble. Your wrath just does its deal. 
With the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flowing waters stood upright as a heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. I am wondering if they were able to, if they had their wits about them on the 10 mile hike to look and say, wow, like there's a fish swimming right there next to my head. And uh, I mean, I don't know. Or was it churned up from the wind and maybe it was, you know, kind of white cappy looking? I, I don't know. It could have been smooth as glass. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you right now, there was a miracle. Well, it's 10 miles. I mean, 10 miles is a good, is a good hike. So the enemy said, this is what Pharaoh said, I will pursue and I will overtake and I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword and my hand shall destroy them. So remember Pharaoh said all that whenever he wanted to have revenge, basically, because his son died. And they, he felt like, oh, well, they're, now they're trapped. They got the ocean and they got these two mountains on either side. So. Yeah, I'm going to go in there and take them out. I'm going to go loot them. I'm going to take all the stuff back that they took from us. You blew with your wind and the sea covered them and they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Remember about all the gods? If you didn't, go back and watch uh, a few nights ago, I guess a month ago, we did Exodus chapters 6 through 11. So watch that. It's talking about the gods. Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. In your mercy, you have led the people whom you have redeemed, and you have guided them by your strength to your holy dwelling. Now, where is this holy dwelling? We don't know yet. But here's what we know. Moses knows where, where they're going. Yeah. Do you remember God interacted with Moses in chapter, what was that, three or four? Mm -hmm. How did he interact with Moses? <laughs> A burning bush. That's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right on, yeah. Right. And God told him, go get the people and bring them back here to worship me. Right? right? So he says, you've guided them by your strength to your holy dwelling. So where is he guiding them to? Back to that same mountain. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's right. Back to the same mountain. That's right. Now, the bush may or may not be there. I don't know that. But to, he said, bring them back to this mountain to worship me. The peoples have heard and are afraid. Sorrow has taken hold on the inhabitants of Philistia. Now, hold on. Where's that? What's going on there? We're going to do a, an erasing of the board here and do a map change. I'm going to put a map on here for you. This is very important, and there is, a, I'm pretty sure there's a map on the website that shows you this, but we'll, we'll go over it because I want you to have a good understanding of what we're dealing with. So here's the Mediterranean, right? The Nile River Delta here. We have the, the Sinai kind of comes up like this this is the what they call the Suez arm and this is Aquaba I'm, I'm gonna butcher that but that's Aquaba Midian's over here and if you'll remember the Philistines remember who, who, who did David fight we haven't got there yet in, in Samuel Goliath and he was he was a giant and who was he fighting with the Philistines, right? The Philistines are right in here. Remember, we have uh, the the um, the modern. This is not one hundred percent, but this is this is modern day Israel's territory here, and we have the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. This is where the Philistines are located. Philistia is what it's called in your Bible. This is only seven or eight days' march. That's pretty quick. They are over here, 
They're actually, they're, they're actually right in here, my bad. They're right in here. They crossed over right in here. They are now over 45 days of, of hiking and marching across the desert, across to here. Or not 40, they're not 45, I'm sorry, not, not yet. They're over 30 days, my bad. I was thinking about next. All right, so 30 days out. Seven days or 30 days? This is the promised land here, right? They're, they're a long way from home. They're a long way from Egypt that they knew. They're a long way from the promised land. Why? Why are they so far away? They didn't need a compass. They had a pillar of smoke and pillar of fire to guide them. But it says here that the peoples have heard and are afraid of what Yahweh is doing. Sorrow has taken hold on the inhabitants of Philistia. Why do you think these people are, are feeling timid, afraid, sad? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this Yahweh did all these things against the Egyptians. And those Hebrew people are on the move. Oh no, are they coming here? Then the chiefs of Edom, you remember we talked about this in Genesis. Edom is down here. That's where um, um, Esau went down here. Right? Remember, we talked about that in Genesis. The chiefs of Edom were amazed. The mighty men of Moab, which is over here on the east side of the Dead Sea. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, takes hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan, which is this whole promised land, are melted away. Fear and dread fall upon them. Why are they so freaked out? And Yahweh's on the move. And if any of them remember anything that happened with Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, they will remember what God promised to them. And what did God promise them? You're next. Right? So this is the promised land. Abraham, you're going to have all this land eventually. Your, your descendants will have that. And you know what? Yahweh just kicked Egypt's butt. So we must be next. Could you, could you understand how they'd be pretty yeah. like, oh boy, we're, we're just in it now. Fear and dread fall upon them. I'm in 16, uh, chapter 15, verse 16 here. <clears throat> By the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people whom you have purchased, remember that redeem is to buy back something, right? Redeem. The people you have purchased pass over. You shall bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance in the place, O Yahweh, which you have made for your dwelling in the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. Now, I think I mentioned this last time. The dry land could be a combination of the great strong wind out of the east and the fact that if that pillar of fire is melting the sand, that's going to dry the land up pretty fast for them to walk across. Okay. Um, that's, that's chapter 15, verses 1 through 19. That is Moses, and he has just written his, uh, Rachmaninoff's third, Mozart's ninth symphony, whatever, okay? He, he has just written this amazing song, and the Hebrew people sing this song forever. They will still sing it in some places today. I don't remember exactly the tune. It's not really catchy. 
to my ears, but I'm not Jewish. Um, but um, then we see in verse 20, Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel or a tambourine, a noisemaker, in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dancing. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. So here we see Moses talking about everybody. And then specifically, we see a woman who's in a position of leadership leading other women in worship of God as well. That God is saying, Yahweh, Moses, Yahweh, through God, Yahweh, Jehovah, God, through Moses writing here and including this, is telling us that women have a place at God's table. Now, he does have roles and hierarchies and stuff that we, we can look at through the whole Bible, but this is not a man-only, male-only um, faith. He wants all. He wants all. It doesn't matter. Remember we talked about some of the Egyptians probably turned, and because it said there was a mixed company among them. And so some of the people from surrounding areas, maybe Libya, Sudan, uh, some of the Egyptians may have said, you know what? I don't like what Egypt's doing. I'm going to go with you guys. And I'm going to head out with you guys. And it doesn't say just the Hebrew women here. It says that she was the leader. She's the prophetess. And with the women went out dancing. So the women from these mixed company have likely gone out and are dancing. So it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're male or female where you're from, what language of origin. God doesn't care about that. He cares about you. He cares about you. All right. So let's take a, let's, let's put a bookmark in this. And let's flip all the way to the back. Revelation 15. Revelation 15. Mike, with that new Bible, you're going to have to break them pages open back there. <laughs> Revelation 15. Now let me give you a little background of where we are in Revelation. I'm, this is not a Revelation se series. This is Exodus. We may do Revelation at maybe 10 years from now. We'll get to that. <laughs> but Exodus, and what we're seeing is in the first uh, books of, the first chapters of Revelation. Uh, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And it is talking about... Um, the return of Jesus and his kingdom and his judgment and his great grace and mercy. And the first kind of half of Revelation, or a little less than half, the first third, is talking uh, about church ages here on earth. And he has specific words for each of those. And then it goes into um, kind of some, it goes into some imagery about what's going to be happening during these last days. Uh, and I think we're in the realm of the last days, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, but we're getting close. We're getting closer. And we start talking about trumpets and bowls and seals to break on a scroll. Uh, so there's there's all sorts of imagery and there's great things that are happening here. And then we get to this place in chapter 15 where John, who's the one writing about this, John got kind of pulled up to heaven and got a sneak peek. He got the advanced preview, right? Um, and John says, I saw another great and marvelous sign in heaven. Now, he's, he's already written 14 chapters of amazing stuff, okay? And here we see him say, I saw another great marvelous sign. Okay, well, man, this guy is still saying it's marvelous, so whatever he's talking about must be something special. And seven angels having the seven last plagues for in them, the wrath of God is complete. When's the last time we heard plagues? Exodus? Okay. So a plague, uh, a lot of times today, plague will be simply used to talk about a 
virus, a bacteria, a pestilence, a parasite, something like that. But a plague is something that is put onto people or the earth as a judgment for disobedience to God. Okay, So he's saying here that I saw a marvelous sign in heaven. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, the seven last judgments for disobedient. For in them the wrath of God is complete. So he's saying that these are the, these are this is it. These are the last seven things that are going to happen. Okay. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. So perhaps um, you could see a very still water mm -hmm. with having fire kind of dancing on it. And those who have the victory over the beast, that is the Antichrist. the Antichrist, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So these are the people who succeeded in not taking the mark. They make it out of the great tribulation. They make it out of the great tribulation. Well, um, I'm not sure if this means that they are dead and they're they were killed because of their faith, or they made it through. I'm not sure on that. And they sang the song of, wait, in verse Revelation 15.3, what does it say here? What does it say, Mike? Revelation 15.3. That's right. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God. We literally see Moses write it in Exodus, and they're in heaven. And what are they singing? The song of Moses. I was just about to say that that's why I think they prophesied it's going to happen at the very end. Yeah, that's right. The servant of God. They sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying. Great and marvelous are your works. Remember number three on our list. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Who shouldn't be afraid of you? Who was afraid of Yahweh? Everybody else in the region. So here we go again. He said, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Because you're so powerful. For you alone are holy. All nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. So the plagues that he put onto Egypt, these other people started saying, uh oh. And what we see here is the people who are with the Antichrist, with the beast of Revelation, the one who is going to try and lead all of humanity away from Jesus. At the very end, there are seven angels, and they've got seven last plagues to take care of business. And he says, all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been revealed. For here they are. There's a seven of them. Okay. And after this, I looked, and now the temple of the tabernacle, some of your verses may say the temple of the dwelling, of the testimony in heaven was opened. The seven angels came out of the temple with seven plagues. They were clothed in pure bright linen, having their chest wrapped with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke. Where have we seen that? That's right. He is the pillar of smoke, right? And remember all the way back to the Abraham covenant. He was the, the, the censor of smoke going through the sacrifice. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. The Bible is connected. It is not individual pieces. This is not old versus new. This is... The Old Testament saying, here's the law, and you know what? You screwed it up. You can't save yourself. But one who's coming, who will? And the New Testament says, he's here, and his name is Jesus. They are connected together. And here we see Exodus to Revelation 
a bridge that connects it all together. That God is not just, well, I guess I better take care of those, those dirty rascals, those Egyptians over there. That's not just like some random part of his plan. That is the overarching plan that he put together since the beginning of creation. And when you know how it's going to end, it should give us greater peace while we're going through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love I love to see that. So that's Revelation 15. We're not going to get any more Revelation tonight, but I wanted to hit that with you guys because I think it's so powerful to see how God just weaves it all together. Brad didn't make this connection. God did. Brad didn't put the, the books in the Bible. God did. I'm just explaining it to you in case you didn't know, but now you know. Okay. All right. Let's go to Exodus 15. Let's go back to v- verse 22 where we left off. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, I've actually got on bradflight.com slash Exodus, I've got maps there for you. I'm not going to try to draw them right now. But I've got maps there for you that uh, will show you where these locations are. Now, here's the deal. They walked for three days through the wilderness. Okay, They're averaging eight to 12 miles a day. It's a pretty good pace. And they're doing three days with no water in a desert. Now we know generic science tells us you can go for three days without water, three weeks without food, three minutes without air. Okay, So they're at the kind of the end of we need water. So they arrive at a location here. Okay. Verse 23, when they came to Merah, they could not drink of the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Merah. Now, I'm not sure that it was called Merah before they got there, but it was called Merah because the water was bitter. So it's a, perhaps someone else called it that. Or, but when we went through the, um, the Passover Seder that we did, remember we had the, the Maror, M-A-R-O-R, which is a derivative of this word. The maror was the bitter herbs, the horseradish. And it was to represent the bitterness of being enslaved. It's part of the Passover. It's part of those four promises we talked about. We're not there yet. Um, uh, We'll talk about the Passover in depth, and we'll invite you to join us later. But mara is saying it's bitter. Maror means it's bitterness. Okay. So the people murmured against Moses. Uh-oh. We've, we've traveled already like 50 kilometers, which is like 80 miles. I'm sorry, reverse that. 50 kilometers, which is like 30 miles. Okay. Through the desert, Egyptian army, whoosh, done. No longer slaves. They were given all the silver, gold, and food to, to leave. Remember all that stuff? And, the, and they were given clothes to wear and stuff. So here they are three days. Three days from here. Great is our God. The women are dancing. Woo! We, look, at, look what God did for us. Three days. So the people murmured against Moses saying, What's the drink, man? Verse 25, and he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had thrown it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Now, I'm going to make an illusion here. I think for me, this is a little bit of a Christophany, that the waters that are available to us can be pretty bitter. You're going through your body trying to reject a transplant. So the stuff that you've been given from the physical world, a fallen planet that we live on, pretty stinky. But 
because of the work of a tree, they were given access to life in the sweet water. Does that sound like anything to you? Sounds like a miracle, but to me, I hear the miserable life that we have. Christ died on a cross made from a tree. He died on the tree to make a life worth living. He gave us life through that tree from his sacrifice. That's what I hear. Now, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but I continue to find those little nuggets where it's Jesus all throughout. Yeah, that's true. Verse 20, uh, twenty-seven and twenty-five. And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he had thrown it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance. So he said, hey, law and order here. And there he tested them. And he said, if you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not afflict you with any of the diseases with which I have afflicted the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. So remember, he gave them pestilence, lice, flies, boils, all the stuff. He was like, quit whining and just be obedient and we won't have problems. I don't want to play that game. I'm not here for that. It's just like with our children. I tell them, all right, guys, go to bed, lay down. Yes, put, put your head on the pillow. Okay, give me, give me that toy. We're not throwing toys. Okay. Yes, I love you. Good night. Okay. Go to sleep. No. No, no more no more stories. Go to sleep. Listen, you're not being obedient. Do I need to go get the the wooden spoon? To give some taps on the backside there? I don't want to. I don't want to do that. That is my least favorite thing to do. But if I love my child and I want what's best for them and they need sleep and they need to be obedient, then I have to do what I have to do. So God is saying, I don't want to do those things. I just need you guys to follow what I'm asking you to do. Is that making sense? <clears throat> verse 27. Then, the, Oh, I'm sorry. Go back to verse 26, that last line there. For I am the Lord who heals you. He also can make you sick. He can also give you boils, pestilence, lice, whatever. But who's the one who heals? Jehovah Rapha. You heard that before? Jehovah Rapha is, is God that heals. He is the God that heals. And um, he says that right here. Exodus 15, 26. And then verse 27. So they kept going after they had some water there. And then they came to Elim, or Elam. I'm saying Elim because that's probably the correct pronunciation. Where there were 12 wells of water and 70 palm trees, and they camped there by the water. Some of them will say date palms. Okay? And if you go to bradflight.com slash exodus, if you're watching because you're already there, just look below this video. And there is actually pictures where you can see the wells and the palm trees today. They're still there. <clears throat> Isn't that amazing? Okay, so that is chapter 15. Let's now jump into 16. And I think 15 is kind of a good introduction for 16 because it's the number that comes afterwards. But I'm, anybody? Anybody? But no, it is because what we're seeing is within a matter of three days, they went from, yes, God did this thing, yeah, woo, to, I need some Ozarka water, please. I mean, how fast? They have a very short attention span, which is probably not unlike us. We're probably very, very similar. Then they set out from Elim 
And all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. So if you go to the, the website, you'll see the map there. And on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So they're at day 45 now. That's what I was saying earlier. They're at day 45 now. The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Do they sound grateful? Do they sound like excited to be on an adventure with Yahweh? No. No. Verse 3, now the children of Israel said to them, would to God, which is their version of saying, I swear to God. That's basically what they're saying. Would to God, we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. They are literally claiming that Moses struck through God's power nine plagues onto Egypt and a tenth one that killed the firstborn of all the people and animals left the place, marched across the desert, went across a sea. Egyptians' army killed. And their claim for all of that is because he wants to kill them in the desert. Come on, guys. Come on. Then the Lord said to Moses, Indeed, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain amount every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. So God says, I am going to give them what they're asking for, but I'm going to put some restraints on it, and I want them to be obedient. Now, my kids go to your house. Are they allowed to have popsicles? No. Are they allowed to have all the candy they can eat? No. So sometimes, they are sometimes we will allow them. So there's this kind of balance between they get to have some fun sweets sometimes, but they have to follow the rules, right? Yeah. I mean, it's very simple. So he's saying, I'm going to provide this for them, free of charge. <laughs> and they can't do it themselves. They're marching through a desert. Where are they going to grow the crops? And they're not sitting in one place long enough to let a crop grow even if they wanted to. So how are they going to feed themselves? They're now 30 to 45 days away from Egypt. Whatever food they had with them at this point is gone. So we see here. Verse 5, chapter 16, verse 5. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, that is on Thursday night to sunset to Friday night at sunset, that's the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in and bring in twice as much as they gather daily. So Thursday night to Friday night, that basically Friday during the day, you're going to gather twice as much because Friday at sunset is the Sabbath until Saturday at sunset. No gathering. And by the way, we're going to go look at a passage in Numbers, which was also written by Moses. We're going to look at a passage in Numbers. from, And he gives us, it's about nine inches. <clears throat> the stuff on the ground, and there's pictures on the website of some pretty good ideas of uh, what it looks like. About nine inches. That's, that may be a little bit short, actually. Nine inches or so. Ah, that's close enough. That they would scoop up nine inches of this stuff. And that's one serving. So however many people you have in your house, you would, you know, so if there's, you know, I've got five in my house, so I'd scoop up 45 inches of this stuff. Okay. So Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, at evening... You shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. As if you didn't know that you weren't out of the land of Egypt and you were across the Red Sea into the land of Midian. 
but apparently he's reminding them. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he hears your murmurings against him, against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? Then Moses said, This will happen when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and bread in the morning to satisfy. For the Lord hears your murmurings which you murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. So Moses and Aaron are basically saying, You're complaining a lot? We're along for the ride too, man. We're not in charge here. He is. You're complaining to us? He's the one hearing it. You're dealing with him. Don't complain to us. Then Moses said to Aaron, <laughs> I can see Moses almost pouting here. Would you would you would you tell them this, Aaron, please? I'm so disgusted with them. Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your murmurings. So as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and indeed the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Which cloud? The pillar, right? Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, In the evening you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. So what were they complaining about they used to have in Egypt? Back in verse 3. Yeah. We sat by pots of meat and we ate bread to the full. So here's God saying, I'm your provider. And you're not a slave. So is this better or is this worse? You're free. And I'm providing this stuff for you like you had before. What's he trying to break them of? Mindset. That mindset. They keep going back to that mindset. They're institutionalized. So in the evening, the quail came up and covered the camp. So they went out and I guess they popped their heads off or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming they were alive, but maybe they weren't. And then they had a bunch of quail, which is delicious, by the way. It's good. Pretty jealous. It's good. Um, every night having quail, though, I guess it could get old. But, um, and in the morning, a layer of dew was surrounding the camp. So a layer of dew, you know, like when you, in the morning time and you're walking through the grass and your feet get wet, but it hasn't rained, it's the dew. When the layer of dew evaporated, on the surface of the wilderness, there lay a small flaky thing. What does your version say? Small flaky thing. As fine as the frost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another... For they did not know what it was. <laughs> they didn't know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Every man is to gather of it according to what he will eat. An omer, that nine inches I was telling you about. For every man, according to the number of your people, every man should take for them whoever lives in his tent. And by the way, I have a picture, an artist depiction of what the camp might look like. It's on the website too. The children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. And when they measured it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing left over. And he that gathered little had no lack. So this is kind of miraculous here. What, what he's saying is some of them picked up like this much. And some of them picked up this much. But when they went to go weigh it, they were both exactly this amount. That's right. That's a miracle. On the fact that there's also bread showing up on the ground. <laughs> well, we don't know. What, what is it? So here's the deal. When you translate, what is it, into Hebrew, you know what the word is? Manna. 
Manna means, what is it? <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I know you were, hint you were trying to look for hints earlier. <laughs> what is it? So whoever they gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever they gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to what he could eat. Moses said to them, let no man leave any of it until the morning. So you eat it all, and that's it. Everyone needs to get your, your nutrients, okay? However, mm -hmm. however what? They didn't, listen to Moses. they didn't listen to Moses. And some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. There is a price for disobedience. Romans 3.23 tells us what? That's right. And Romans 6.23 the accompanies real well with that. What does that one say? The wages, the wages of sin is death. So what you earn because of your sin actions is death. And here we see them, they're gathering too much. A few of them have gathered too much here. And they left it over overnight. They left it, and they didn't have Tupperware. They didn't have the Dead Sea Tupperware supply store available at this point. So the wages of disobedience is worms and stinkiness. Because when we tell a lie, when we cheat on our wife, when we uh, talk gossiping about people, what is the wages of those things? It's stinky, wormy, nasty. Right? right. He, he gave them a, a literal word picture in real life, in real time. Verse 21. They gathered it every morning, every man according to what he could eat. And when the sun got hot, it melted. So guess what? Could you sleep all day long? No. And was it, was it, was it your job to collect for everybody in the whole entire camp? Who was supposed to collect? Head of the household. Head of the household. Collect for everybody in your tent. As a man... You get up and you go to work. Is that you get? I'm just reading. Yeah, that's true. Now on the sixth day they gathered twice as much bread, two omers per man, and then all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses. He said to them, "This is what the Lord has said: Tomorrow is the Sabbath, a holy Sabbath to the Lord." Bake that which you will bake today, and boil that which you will boil, and all that which remains over, lay up for yourselves to be kept until the morning. Well, hold on a second here. These other people kept it to the morning, and what happened to it? It went bad. It spoiled, right? But here he's saying, it's Thursday night, so Friday morning, Friday morning, get up, get extra, bake it, boil it, whatever, and then you're going to have that tomorrow to eat. And you're like, you just, those, those guys just had worms. Why am I, I don't understand what's happening. There's literally bread forming on the ground. So none of this makes any sense anyway. So whatever, Moses, let's do this thing. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so they laid it up until the morning, just as Moses commanded. And it did not stink, nor was there any worm in it. And Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find in the field the food, right? Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. It happened that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found nothing. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Is this the first time we've ever seen Sabbath be asked to be observed? He, he has never asked anyone else to observe the Sabbath before until this point. But have we ever seen a seventh day of rest? Creation. Creation. God set that example all the way back in Genesis 1. He created the heavens and the earth. He created the water, the mountains, the plants, the animals, humans, and then... He rested. God does not ask us to do something that he is not prepared to show us. The house of Israel named it manna, which means... <laughs> Uh, dude, what is this? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I have a picture of coriander seeds and bdellium, which is a, uh, have you ever seen, I know we're all, we're in, we're in Houston, East Texas right now. Have you seen the big pine tree and you see like the sap coming down the side of the pine tree? How it can get a little, like, look like little balls almost kind of, the little sap, you know what I'm talking about? That's what bdellium is. It's little sap balls. So, and it normally has kind of a whiter color to it. So coriander seeds are green. That kind of round, small seed. You've seen those before. And then bdellium or that, those little sap balls are kind of the white color. The, they're saying here, it was like coriander seed was white. Its taste was like wafers made with honey. If anybody, you ever had a stroop waffle? Stroop waffle? I know they, they put them on the airline. Surely you guys have seen those before. That's what this thing tasted like. Like a sweet honey wafer. They're delicious. Really good. Um, taste, the, the taste was like wafers made with honey. Verse 32. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations to come so that they may see the bread that I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put that nine inches, uh, an omer for a full man in it, and place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. So they're setting aside a remembrance for this thing. And as the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate the manna until they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is one-tenth of an ephah. I am curious. What goes through your head when you see grown men going out into the desert, scratching up white stuff off the ground, saying, Honey, breakfast is served. Anybody else from outside of the encampment, a non-Hebrew person, is probably being looked at. They're like, what are these, what are these people doing here, right? Let's jump over to Numbers 11. I don't plan on going through Numbers as a group. Uh, if you want to, Numbers is a fantastic. It is a continuation of the story of Moses and the, the Israelites, the Hebrews, in the desert time together. Uh, we're not going to go through it all together, but I will do things like this, where I will make connections to what we're reading in Exodus. Um, so uh, Numbers is going to be uh, the fourth book of the Bible, and we're going to be in chapter 11 here. And the name, the chapter heading, which when they wrote this, there was no chapter headings. But the chapter heading in my Bible is pretty appropriate. It says, Complaints in the Desert. 
Okay. So I'm going to read through this, and I think you're going to see why I'm including Numbers 11 in our Exodus 16 reading. Okay. It's just, and it just happens tonight. I don't do a whole lot of crossover, but Exodus 15 and Revelation 15, they just they fit perfectly together. And Exodus 16 and Numbers 11 fit perfectly together. So that's why I'm including them. Um, now, when the people complained openly before the Lord, the Lord heard and his anger burned. Then the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. And the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire was quenched. And he called the name of the place Tabera, because of the fire of the Lord burned among them. The mixed multitude, uh-oh, where have we seen that? That was in Exodus, uh, was that 12, I think? We talked about the mixed multitude coming out. That was among them lusted, and the children of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate in Egypt for free. The cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. Whew, that sounds good. But now our life is dried up. Talk about dramatic drama queens. Now our life is dried up. There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Talk about a bunch of whiny babies. Goodness gracious. So here's here's verse 7. The manna was as coriander seed, and it looked like bdellium. Remember I told you about the sap ball things? The, the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills, and they beat it in a mortar and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it, and the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked in oil. When the dew, which is like pancakes basically, guys. When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna fell on it. Then Moses heard the people weep throughout their families, every man in the opening of his tent, and the anger of the Lord burned greatly. Moses was also displeased. Yeah, I'm doing all these things, and I'm trying to I'm trying to work with you guys to work with God here, and you're embarrassing me. <laughs> Moses said to the Lord, Why have you hurt your servant? And why have I not found favor in your eyes? That you lay the burden of all these people on me. Moses is kind of whining now. Have I conceived all of these people? Have I given them birth that you should say to me, carry them on your bosom as a nurse bears a nursing child? He's saying, basically, they're helpless babies. You want me to carry them through the whole desert like this? I mean, Moses is kind of losing his cool a little bit here. Have I given them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse bears the nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? All the way to there? All the way there? Come on, God. And where's this meat that I'm supposed to give to all the people? For they weep to me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden's too heavy for me. If you do this to me, Please kill me at once. If I have found favor in your eyes, do not let me see my misery. Man, talk about having a bad day. He's feeling a little bit stressed out. And I think he is at the end of himself. But you know what? When we get to the end of ourselves, what happens? We get a little crazy. But that's a perfect time for God to step in. Right. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of meeting, that they may make a stand there with you. So he's saying, don't go through this alone. Gather a bunch of people who can counsel with you and help carry the burden and help make this thing happen. Don't go by yourself. Not meant to go through this thing by yourself, Mike. And I will come down and I will speak with you there, and I will take of the spirit which is on you, and I will put it on each of them. And they will bear the burden of the people with you, and you will not bear it by yourself. Who equips us to share the work of the Lord? The Lord. We don't equip ourselves, God does it. And say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, you shall eat meat. 
For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Remember, they're so whiny. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat, and you shall eat not one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out at your nostrils. <laughs> he said, you're going to be so tired of it, but you're going to have meat. And it will be nauseating to you because you rejected the Lord who was among you and have wept before him, saying, Why did we come out of Egypt? And Moses said, The people I am with number 600,000 foot soldiers, and you have said, I will give them meat to eat, that they may eat a whole month. So Moses is starting to do a little bit of math. He's not using God's math right now. He's using Moses' math. He's like, okay, I got 600,000 people plus women plus children. We're like, like, remember we talked about one and a half to three million people hanging out in a giant camp here. And Moses says, uh, will the flocks and the herds be slaughtered for them to satisfy them? Or will all the fish of the sea be gathered for them to satisfy them? He's like, how in the world am I supposed to feed this army? How you, what do you want me to do here, God? We only have so many sheep. We only have so many goats. We only, I mean, you want us to kill all of them right now? And the Lord said to Moses, listen to this, guys. Remember we talked about this, the, the mighty right hand of God? And what does he say in verse 23? And the Lord says to Moses, is the, is the hand of the Lord shortened? Now you will see if my word will happen to you or not. He, he was basically saying, dude, quit whining. I'm still God. I'm still in control. I still know what I'm talking about. And the Lord said to Moses, is the hand of the Lord shortened? Now you will see if my word will happen to you or not. Moses went out and he spoke to the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered the 70 elders, men of the elders of the people, and set them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud, spoke to him, and took of the spirit that was on him, and gave it to the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do it again. Then we're going to skip over here to verse 31 of chapter 11. Now a wind from the Lord started up, and it swept quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side, and a day's journey on the other side, around the camp, and about two cubits above the ground. That's a cubit's about 18 inches, so about three feet above the ground. So the dove were just like, or the quail, I'm sorry, were hanging out three feet above the ground. You just Easy targets, right? Easy targets. <clears throat> and I actually have brightflight.com slash exodus there are some pictures of the harlequin quail which is native to arabia and a picture of what their habitat would have looked like and so that's why they can grab them at three feet because there's little bushes that are about three feet tall ah. <laughs> um and the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. Those who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. While the meat was between their teeth, before it was chewed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a very great slaughter, and he called the name of that place Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had the craving. The people journeyed from Kibroth Hatava to Hazaroth, and they camped at Hazaroth. So, God provided for them and they apparently didn't turn around and say thank you one time yeah. it was like whenever he was making bread come and he said let me see if you guys really deserve it what are you going to do to make me continue to do that do you have obedience yes right did their obedience have anything to do with them being saved and coming out of Egypt did they do anything to warrant God's favor? No. But you would certainly think that because of the great and mighty things that he did for those people, that they would want to be obedient yeah. to him. You would think so. And in the same way, I'm challenging you 
and you and me, we have been forgiven our eternal sin debt by Jesus. What did we do to earn that? We did nothing. Absolutely. Big, big, big fat zero. Shouldn't we be living a life of obedience out of such great thankfulness and gratitude? I don't live my life like that to earn my salvation. I live it because of my salvation. And perhaps when I'm given a roof over my head and a vehicle that drives and some meals to eat during the day and I'm, I'm still above ground, that maybe I should give thanks to God for all that I have. I'm not as rich as this person and I'm not as sickly as this person and I'm not as influential as this person. I'm not as anonymous as this person. God doesn't care about those things. He wants you. He wants me. He wants you. Just the way that you are. He will do the work in you and through you. That's not your job. That's not your job. Because if that was our job, we would have done it already. We didn't. Very hard. God gives us all these graces to say, listen, you know, I'm doing this and this. Prove me that you need it and deserve it. And why doesn't everybody say, we got this, we know we got to do it. So why live differently? Why do people still fail? And it's just a few of us that are doing right and we're trying to get them back on the line to where they can rejoice and get senses. That brings up a great point. It says that there is a Stairway to heaven, yeah. and there's a highway to hell. And if that says anything about the perceived crowds uh, to each, right, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. That's true. Right. Yeah. Same, same thing. Since I've been saved, I don't think about that road to hell anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm gaining too much to where I'm going with who all I can bring with me. That's right. But I quit thinking about the devil or hell or anything else. You know, it's, a, it's part of me to mm-hmm. know what I want to do and how I should bring other people to become a, to have more disciples and, mm-hmm. and gathering. So the, one of the reasons that I include Exodus 15 and 16 together tonight is because... This is a picture, snapshot of a believer. They become saved. They're excited. They're so grateful to God for getting them through whatever sin has been holding on to them, whatever debt that they they had owed for their, their, their sinful lives, their sinful living. And they are just, God, you are awesome and you have just saved me. Thank you so much. And not very long afterwards, many times, we see, where is this? Why don't I have that? I thought you loved me, God. Why aren't you with me right now? What's happening? Did God change? No. 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 It's their weakness and they're they're blaming it on God. Why did you let me do this? Yeah. It's on us. It's on us. Well, thanks for coming tonight. I'm glad that you were able to go through Exodus 15 and 16 with me. I'm glad you joined us as well. Join us next time for Exodus 17. Have a good night.